Okay, in this lecture, we take a look at an application involving angular momentum. That application has to do with spinning tops, which are also referred to as gyroscopes. I have a couple of examples here of gyroscopes on my desk. Let me go ahead and demonstrate them to you. So first of all, I have right here this gyroscope, which consists of this gold disc. I've tied some string around the axis of rotation. I'll be pulling on the string in just a few moments. So I then rotate the gold disc such that it then rotates in uniform circular motion. And then the gold disc is positioned here within this set of rings, black, white, and red, such that there is no external torque that is exerted upon the gold disc. So then therefore, if the gold disc, for example, is rotating like so, it then has an angular momentum vector that's pointing in this direction. This then means that because the angular momentum is conserved, the gold disc will always have an angular momentum vector that points straight up like this. So as I spin this up and then rotate this assembly around, you're going to see that the orientation of the gold discs, the gold disc rather, remains the same. In other words, it's always going to be rotating like so, giving me an angular momentum vector that points straight upwards. Now, there is a little bit of friction here between the gold disc and this ring assembly. The structure of the ring assembly itself also impedes the rotation of the gold disc a little bit. However, under most instances, you'll see that this gyroscope here maintains a constant angular momentum vector. So let me go ahead and spin this up. So I did so by tying some string here along the axle. And now I'm going to go ahead and then spin this up like so. And now, right now, the gold disc has an angular momentum vector that points like this. And then watch what happens as I start to rotate the assembly around a little bit. Notice that the orientation of the gold disc is a constant. It's always rotating such that the angular momentum vector points upwards. Now, you can see that, of course, it is wiggling around a little bit. The reason for that is because, yes, there is an external torque here due to a little bit of friction. There's also external torques that are applied because of the structure of these rings themselves. But if I do rotate this around slowly like so as I'm doing, notice that the orientation of the gold disc is essentially a constant. It always gives us an angular momentum vector that looks like this. Now, this gold disc here within this gyroscope assembly is positioned such that there is essentially no external torque that's exerted upon it. However, I can change the situation a little bit. For example, I'm going to take this gyroscope here and I'm going to spin this up once again to uniform circular motion, and then I'm going to set it on the table. As long as I have it perfectly positioned, the gravitational force vector straight downwards applied at the center of mass is along the axis of rotation. The angle between the moment arm, which will go between the point of the pivot here on the desk to the center of mass, and the gravitational force vector straight downwards is 180 degrees. So if you do tau equals r cross f, the sine of 180 degrees is equal to zero, and then therefore no external torque will be exerted upon the system. However, there is friction, of course, between the pivot point here and the desk itself, so that friction then ultimately causes this to begin to tip over a little bit as energy is lost as heat. When that happens, you're gonna to start to see the gyroscope appear to rotate on the desk in a specific way. This is referred to as a precession. So let me go ahead and spin this up. It's a little tricky to do. Okay, and then I'll position it on the desk, like so. And that's reasonably well balanced, as you can see. So right here, basically, the angle between the gravitational force vector straight downwards and the moment arm, which goes from the pivot point to the center of mass, is basically 180 degrees. Not quite, however. You can see that it's beginning to wobble a little bit. And the reason for that is because there's a little bit of friction between the pivot point and the top itself, thereby causing it to begin to undergo this type of rotation. This type of rotation is referred to as a precession. Okay, the precession becomes more and more pronounced here, like so, as the energy is lost as heat. And I'm going to set up a similar situation. Instead of using the desk, however, as my point to pivot, I'm instead going to use this stand. So let me go ahead and spin this guy up here to uniform circular motion. I'll position it on the sand stand, but when I do, I'm going to kind of position it off to the side. When I do, there is a moment arm that goes from the pivot point to the center of mass, 
it's going to be on an angle with respect to the gravitational force vector. This then means that there will be an external torque due to gravity exerted upon this gyroscope, causing it then to process. So let me go ahead and spin this one up, like so. And then I'll go ahead and position it here on the pivot. Like so. And notice the procession that's beginning to occur. Like so. Okay, what we'll be interested in calculating in just a few moments is the rate of procession. Before I do, however, I can actually use that bicycle wheel that I've used in a previous demonstration as a spinning top as well, as a gyroscope. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to reposition my phone in order to demonstrate this. Okay, so there's my bicycle wheel. It's hanging from some rope there. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is hold it in my hand like this, and I'm going to spin it up. Like so. And now I'm going to let go of it. Watch what happens when I do. Notice that the bicycle wheel, much like a spinning top, for example, begins to process just like that. Okay, before the rope broke. <laughs> Okay, let me go ahead and position my phone back. Like so. Let me reposition the phone this way as well. Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna be interested in calculating here is the rate of precession when there is an external torque due to gravity exerted upon the gyroscope. exerted upon the gyroscope. Okay, so we have a little bit of a derivation here in the run-through, so let me go ahead and erase the board here. Of course, make sure that you've copied this down prior to me doing so. Okay, and then here's going to be our setup. Okay, let's say that right here is the axis of rotation of the gyroscope. Let's say that the gyroscope consists of this rotating disc, like so. The disc has a mass M. Let's say that right here is the center of mass. And then this right here is the pivot point. The easiest way to visualize this is, of course, in terms of this stand in one of my demonstrations. So right here is the pivot. Okay, this right here is the vertical direction, like so. Okay, and then let's say that the gyroscope is rotating like this. So then therefore, if it's rotating like so, it's doing so with an angular velocity. This is the angular velocity of the disc, the angular speed, if you will. And this is referred to as omega spin. Okay, and then because it is rotating like this in this description, this then means that we're going to have an angular momentum vector that points in this direction like so. So right here is the angular momentum vector, L. Okay, now right here is where the force of gravity, of course, is going to be applied to the center of mass. So that then looks like this. This right here is mg. And then we go ahead and define an angle on the diagram. The angle that we define on the diagram is this angle right here, which is then therefore the same as this angle here. Okay, now off to the side, let's go ahead and do R cross F to describe the external torque exerted upon the gyroscope due to the force of gravity. So right here is the moment arm, like so. That's like this. And then right here is the force of gravity straight downwards. That's like this. Okay, now in order to do R cross F, we of course need the angle between these two vectors. Okay, in terms of the angle theta, the angle theta of course is right here. In terms of the angle theta, notice that the angle between the two vectors is 180 minus theta. So right here is the supplement. This is pi minus theta. Okay, let's go ahead and calculate the external torque using right-hand rule. 
So to do so, we have R cross F like so, which then gives us a torque vector out of the board. Okay, so here's our external torque vector, like so. And then in magnitude, it's equal to MGR sine of pi minus theta, like so. Okay, let's go ahead and do a little bit of a trig identity here to simplify this expression. We'll use the subtraction identity for sine. Okay, so I get MGR, and then in brackets, we'll say sine of the first angle, oops, sine of pi, excuse me, sine of the first angle, times cosine of the second, like so, and then minus cosine of the first angle times sine of the second, like so. Okay, so let's simplify the brackets here. Sine of pi is zero, and then just be careful with negative signs here. Cosine of pi is negative one. That negative sign cancels with this one here to give me a positive. So after you do the math here, what you end up with is just MGR sine theta, like so. Okay, now look at the direction of that torque vector. It's out of the board. Now recall that torque is change in angular momentum with respect to time. So then therefore, what is the direction of the delta L vector? It's out of the board as well. So note that tau is out of the board. which then means that, therefore, delta L is out of the board. This then means that the top will begin to process. Here's the easiest way of visualizing this. I'll use this stick here to illustrate. My stick is rotating like this in this description. So as the stick rotates like so, right here is the initial angular momentum vector that I drew on the board behind me. But because the external torque is out of the board, this then means that the delta L vector is out of the board. So then therefore think of it like this, initial angular momentum plus change in angular momentum equals then a final angular momentum vector like so. So then therefore as my stick here is rotating like so, the external torque exerted upon it due to gravity is gonna to begin to cause it to process in this direction like so in this description. So here's then the easiest way to visualize that in terms of a diagram. Okay, so once again, we have our three-dimensional space here. Let me go ahead and complete this a little bit more carefully like so. And then on the top board, we have right here, for example, let me draw it right here our initial angular momentum vector L. L, by the way, is equal to I times omega spin, where the I is the rotational inertia of the disk, for example, on the top board. However, we already know that the delta L vector is out of the board. So you now have to visualize this diagram in three dimensions. Here's the easiest way of picturing it. Okay, let me complete the drawing here. See, and let me complete, complete the drawing here. This drawing right here. Okay, now, right here is the initial angular momentum vector, and then associated with that from the top board, for example, is this big blue angle theta right here. That's when the stick is oriented like this. But then our final angular momentum vector is where the stick is like this. That's right here here on the diagram. The angle that this angular momentum vector makes with respect to the vertical direction is still the same blue angle theta. This six is just that you have to think of this blue angle theta as kind of like sticking out of the board at you like so. Right here is the delta L vector that's coming out of the board that I've already indicated. What we're interested in describing here is the rate of change of this angle. In other words, this angle per time. That angle per time is describing the rate of precession. The rate of precession is described by another angular speed. This is referred to as omega precession. That's what we're gonna determine here using this diagram. Okay, now let's go ahead and do so. 
omega precession is going to equal delta phi over delta t. Okay, how do we end up with that from what we already have on the top board with respect to the external torque? Well, external torque equals delta L over delta T. The external torque is MGR sine theta. So let's go ahead and plug that in. Like so. Okay, and now the delta L. The delta L is this right here. Think of this as an arc length on a circle where the radius of the circle are these green dashed lines here and here, which are the same value. Now, what are these green dashed lines equal to? Well, for example, if you examine this green dashed line right here, you'll notice that it's the opposite side of a right triangle that looks like this. This right here then therefore is L sine theta, just as this is up here for the other triangle in the background, this is also L sine theta. So then therefore, delta L, this right here, the arc length of a circle, well, recall that arc length divided by radius is equal to angle. So arc length divided by radius, the radius is L sine theta, excuse me, is equal to angle. So delta L is equal to angle multiplied by radius. That then is what goes here in the numerator of the expression. Okay, so delta L is delta phi L sine theta, and then we divide by delta T, and then boom, right there is what we're looking for. That right there is omega precession. Notice that the sine of the angle cancels out. So the rate of the precession is not going to depend upon the angle that the um, top makes with respect to the vertical direction. That's why in one of the demonstrations, as the top was losing energy due to heat and was dipping down lower and lower, the rate of precession as it was rotating actually did not change. The sign of the angle here cancels out. Okay, let's go ahead and move the L down to the other side, and then therefore right here is omega precession. Omega precession is therefore equal to MGR divided by L. It's a simple expression to use in basic examples, but this expression is not given to you on the AP Physics C exam. You do have to commit it to memory, or you have to remember how to do this derivation. But should you encounter a problem, for example, on the AP Physics exam involving the precession of a top, you just have to remember the expression. MGR over L, that's equal to omega precession. So once again, this is describing the rate of the precessional angle changing with respect to time as the top is then rotating and precessing. Okay, so to conclude this video, let's go ahead and just do a basic example. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at that example here after I erase the board. Copy it down into your notes. Okay, it says the top is spinning with a frequency of 30 hertz. That's describing the omega spin. So the omega spin is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. The frequency is what's given to us as 30 hertz. So this is 60 pi radians per second. Okay, the top is mounted such that we're given the following values. Its mass is 0.05 kilograms, and its rotational inertia is 5 times 10 to the minus 4, kilogram meter square. So the mass M is 0.05 kilograms, and then I is given to us numerically as opposed to a formula, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 kilogram meter square. Okay, the center of mass of the top is 0.04 meters from the pivot. That's the R in the expression for omega, expre uh, omega precession. That's the R in the expression. That's not necessarily the radius of the disk itself or anything like that. So then the distance r in the expression is given to us as 0.04 meters. And it just asks us to then calculate the rate of precession. Nothing more than that. So let's go ahead and find it. Omega precession is MGR over L, where the L in the denominator of the expression is I times omega spin. Like so. And now we just calculate. Nothing more than that. So let me grab my calculator. Just got to plug in the numbers and know what's what, of course. So 0.05 kilograms for the mass times g times the distance r, and then divided by omega times, or omega spin rather, times i. 
So five times 10 to the minus four, and then multiply that by 60 times pi. There we go. And this comes out to be about 0.2 radians per second, like so. So in my next video, then we'll take a look at a nice application.